Thank you everyone for having me uh, this evening. I, I guess you can all hear me all right and, and see me. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, good, good. And it's nice to see people that I've corresponded with as in Mary Newell. Um, lovely to be able to talk sort of kind of face to face. So um, what, what I would like to do is um, talk about our family a little bit tonight. Um, and our family probably reflects uh, many that, that made um, the trip to New Zealand from different parts of the world in the 1870s. There's nothing special about us. We're an ordinary Kiwi family, but our pioneering ancestors were brave and resourceful, and perhaps that made them special. Now, my father's family, as you've guessed, come from Ireland. My mother's from Scotland and my husband's from Denmark. And now all the families have a really good sprinkling of English born amongst them. Tonight I'm sharing with you the journey that my great grandparents, uh, Michael Brainy and Sabina, or Sophia as she was called, took in 1876 to New Zealand. And perhaps just a little of my own journey of discovery back to my Irish roots. And I thought I would start a little bit with how I found my connection to Anadown. Now, sort of at this point, I, I would like to share my screen with you because I want to switch to PowerPoint um, and that to sort of kind of help me along with the talk. And that, so if you just bear with me for a little minute till we get ourselves organized and I'll put you onto um, my share screen. Right. There we go. There. Now, can somebody tell me? Have you? Are you sharing my screen with me and meeting my great grandparents? Yeah, we can see um, that. If you want to just yeah. move into can to you slide. you see my? Okay, that is. Okay, I am in slide mode on mine, but not on yours. So let me just go back. I'll just stop sharing for a minute and just go back to try it again. And we'll try this one. Technology always tends to let you down at the last minute, doesn't it? Or yeah. it's the operator, I'm not quite sure which. Technology. <laughs> How does that look? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Okay, so um, this, this is my great grandparents, um, Michael and Sophia Graney. So uh, my, my researching um, uh, began with Michael's marriage certificate, which gave me his father's name, and that's always a good place to, to start. I'll just see if we can move that on, but it doesn't want to do what There we go. Now, um, obviously, with marriage certificates, they give you dad's name um, and gave me Michael's occupation in 1871. So I had a little bit of a start here. But of course, it didn't tell me where Michael um, came from or where Francis came from. But always in, in my father's generation, there was always a great deal of talk about um, island heritage and, and things, all things Irish and a little bit of focus on Galway. So I sort of kind of was a little bit suspicious. So anyway, um, I also had my grandfather, James's birth certificate, stating that his father came from, and is it Cahamoris? I got my tongue around the name properly. I understand on the on the birth register that the spelling is not correct, but that would be probably um, phonetically spelled here in, in New Zealand. Now, the internet was just starting to make an impact on family research. And eventually I found Ask About Ireland, Griffiths Valuation, and of course, Maps. And that really set me on my, on my way. Now, Griffith's valuation, as you'd be aware, gives me, um, uh, gave me a, um, a location. And of course, that was Anadown. 
And then I discovered that I could overlay a modern map on, on the Griffiths valuation one. And this gave me my first look at what I affectionately started to call my ancestral land, map reference 27 Glenroy Bay. This was my first discovery. And then of course you just have to go through Google Maps and look for more information and clearer pictures. And so um, many of you might well re uh, recognize the overhead picture here. Um, the long drive up the property where my friend went to meet Michael Fahey. And this is also the house that my great grandfather Michael grew up in and then left um, to come to New Zealand or rather left to go to England. Now, uh, after this, there followed a, a post on um, Ireland reaching out, asking about Grainies and Anadown, which of course put me in contact with your Paul or Grainy. Um, and with um, get, having contact with Paul, uh, he provided me with lots of information. And one of the things that I found most interesting was that he sent me this, this map that he had outlined all the Grainy properties on. Um, and that was really a real burn. I, I poured over that for hours on end. So my Francis Grainy came from way down here on the, in the bottom corner, in this distinctive um, shaped piece of, of outlining here of the land. And so with that, um, I was relatively happy that, yes, I knew where everybody came from and, and we let it lie there for a little while. But in 2016, a friend of mine, Heather, and I were talking about Irish um, research. And we discovered that we both had ancestors from Anadown. And then strangely enough, they were only seven or eight kilometres apart, as it turned out in the end. But that's another story. Now, it just happened that at the time, um, Heather and her daughter were planning a trip to Ireland and a visit to Anadown. Now, I eventually picked up some courage and, and asked Heather that if she had time, would she just do a drive past the ancestral land and maybe just take a photo? And, and I thought just knowing someone that I knew who had seen my ancestral land um, was going to be exciting enough. But Heather, bless her, did more than that. She and her daughter drove up to the house and met Michael Fahey. After telling Michael who she was and why she had landed on his doorstep, he told her that his uh, grandmother was Julia Graney. Now, Julia is the granddaughter of my great-grandfather's brother, James, which made her my second cousin once removed. Woohoo! Suddenly I found I had a lot of third and fourth cousins in Anadown, and I had really established a connection. So that's sort of how I came to, to um, have such a, a connection to Anadown. But let me now go back to my great grandfather, Michael. Now, Michael's um, parents, Francis. Uh, Grainy and Catherine Mannion were married on the 24th of February 1840 in the parish of Anadown. Their witnesses were Martha Pisson and um, Anna Lally. In the um, parish registers, I eventually found uh, three children of Francis and Catherine. Uh, they were J Patrick, and I knew that for certain Michael had a younger brother called Patrick as he too had immigrated to New Zealand. The parish records provided Michael, um, pr sorry, um, proved that Michael had, um, was their second born um, and their second son, born in Glenry Bay, probably on the 24th of October, 1845. And I knew from the Griffiths information that Francis was a farmer on a block of land leased from Mark Lynch. But apart from um, that, and then some um, appearances in the petty sessions, I knew little more of Francis or his family until eventually I found Francis's death in 1890. Now, as for Michael, 
uh, I don't know quite when, he and his younger brother Patrick left Ireland for England. Obviously, uh, movement between the two countries is considered as internal uh, travel. But it's probably, it was probably inevitable uh, that Michael would drift away from the family to look for work. When uh, the census for England was taken on the 2nd of April, 1871. And that had left me with a time gap of 26 years, which I haven't been able to fill yet. We never know, we may find something one day. Now, the 1871 census um, showed me that Michael and, uh, is listed with his younger brother, Patrick, living at 107 Front Street, when Leighton in County Durham. Now, Michael's occupation is given as a labourer in a foundry, and Patrick's is a labourer for a mason. However, Michael gives his occupation at the time of his marriage just seven months later as a coke burner, which wasn't a particularly um, pleasant job, it was hot and dangerous. Now, interestingly, he and Patrick are lodgers in the household of Mary Fahey, who's a widow, um, age 40, and her three children. The household has several lodgers and all give their place of birth as island. Mary's home appears to be a lodging house for Irish men, all of whom are working in either the coal mines, a foundry, or the quarry. And in 1881, Mary is still taking in lodges, and again, they are all from Ireland, but this time the enumerator has added Galway. So there was obviously a very strong connection with Mary and her people from, um, from Galway. Now, by um, November of 1871, Michael had uh, met and married Sophia Scully. Sophia was also born in Ireland, probably Galway, but I'm not 100% sure, in 1852. She was the daughter of Andrew Scully and Bridget Leonard and had been in England since at least 1861. Now, Michael and Sophia's firstborn a son died in infancy, and their second son, Andrew and Francis, was Andrew Francis, was born on the 4th of May, 1874, followed by Catherine um, on the 23rd of February, 1876. And it is with these two children that Michael and Sophia immigrated to New Zealand. Now, as a country, New Zealand was short of manpower for infrastructure work, our roads, railways, the public buildings, the ports, telegraph networks, etc., all needed manpower. New Zealand agents uh, held meetings throughout Britain, and it is highly likely that Michael attended one of these meetings in the mid-1870s. I, I can only imagine the discussions that must have taken place after the children were put to bed. A long sea voyage would have been daunting for a young mother with a small child and a six-month-old baby. But the decision was made and Michael and Sophia became part of the assisted immigrant scheme of the New Zealand government. And so it was in 1876, Michael and Sophia would have packed what they could take with them to New Zealand. Um, immediate day-to-day -day needs were packed into a canvas bag. And then there was a, a box that was marked seasonal clothing that they would need on the voyage. And the box would be brought up onto the deck of the sh as the ship passed through the tropics and again as they approached the southern ocean. Having left uh, Wynn-Layton, uh, probably by train, they crossed into Scotland and onto Glasgow and finally to Greenock on the River Clyde, where the sailing ship Oamaru was taking on board passengers for New Zealand. The Oamaru was a grand sailing ship. She was um, built especially for the long voyages. 
um, and she was a fully rigged three-masted iron ship of some 1,300 tons, larger than preceding immigrant ships, and this would be her second voyage. And leaving Greenock on the 23rd of September, 1876, with Captain Hood in command, the voyage was completed in a record 84 days. Excuse me a minute, I just need a wee sip. Now, um, Michael was listed on the passengers list uh, as a farm labourer. But it's unlikely that he worked um, either on a farm, either here or in the UK. It's more likely that at the time of immigration, farm labourers were what was wanted in New Zealand. And it was probably just easy to write it on the passengers list. Now, fortunately, two diaries of the voyage have survived. One written by a single woman, Jane Finlayson, which records the day-to-day -day life aboard the ship. And the other by John McDowell, a married man who kept records of the weather, of the latitude and the longitude readings. And it's from these two diaries that I was able to get a sense of the voyage Michael and Sophia were part of. So, for example, um, three days out from Greenock, uh, most of the passengers were suffering from seasickness and the feeling amongst the passengers was one of despair. Around this time, the first case of measles was reported to the ship's doctor. However, it seems that fairly quickly routines became established and the life and life settled down for everyone. Now, all Interesting, I thought, was that all bedding was taken up on the deck to air, and the boards on, on which they slept were scrubbed and disinfected on a regular basis. There was also a clergyman on board uh, returning to Dunedin who started a school offering reading, writing, and arithmetic lessons. Now, throughout October, they experienced a mix of strong wing, winds, heavy rain, and did come. But by mid-October, the weather had turned hot. Then while uh, crossing the Southern Ocean, iceberg watches became part of the routine. The captain even offered a bottle of grog to any person who spotted an iceberg between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. Now the diaries don't tell me what the grog was or, or who actually had one or got one. But in late November, snow fell on the deck of the Oamaru. By the end of the voyage, there had been 31 cases of measles and two cases of typhoid on board. The ship's doctor advised that they would um, likely be quarantined uh, for about a week on arrival at Port Chalmers. However, much would depend on the government inspectors when they came aboard. <clears throat> the 16th of December, saw the Oamaru anchored off the entrance to the Otago Harbour. Now, she would be waiting on the paddle steamer Tug Geelong to guide her through the Otago heads. But the Omaru had raised a yellow flag, signaling, signaling that um, they had measles on board. And immediately the ship and passengers were quarantined. The Married and single women were transferred to Quarantine Island and the men taken to nearby Goat Island. This would be their home until the 5th of January, 1870. The facilities though were clean and comfortable. And one of the first things the women needed to do was to wash all the clothing and presumably the bedding. 
and just in this slide here on on the point uh, is where some of the buildings still exist from when they were used for quarantine purposes. In, in the background, um, the more modern port of Port Chalmers. And just down here is the uh, beginning of one of um, Goat Island. Now on the 5th of January, 1877, 100 families, including Michael and Sophia, were discharged from quarantine and given the freedom to start a new life. Firstly, they were transported by a steam vessel to Port Chalmers and then travelled by train from Port Chalmers to Dunedin and then to Cavisham Barracks until onward travel um, was organised for them. And, and this uh, photograph is probably taken around 1880. So this would be what Michael and Sophia would have seen. Um, there's obviously two, two ships in here at the wharf at the moment, um, it, but it would certainly be uh, a very similar view that they would see. Now, um, Cavisham Barracks was built especially to house immigrants and could be um, and could hold up to 400 people at a time. Now, families, uh, single men and single women were all separated according to conventions of the time. And each had their own dining room and ablution areas. Um, and near the entrance uh, to Cavisham Barracks uh, and suitably furnished were the engaging offices where prospective employers could interview employees. And perhaps this is where Michael obtained work, which then took him um, further south to Milton and Balclutha. The New Zealand government doesn't uh, keep the census returns. Um, so the ge for genealogists and historians, the nearest document we have that traces of families' movements are the national electoral rolls, which give us an address plus an occupation. So um, it's a little difficult to know for sure exactly where the family is or what Michael is doing between their arrival and the birth of their fourth child, Patrick, on the 17th of April, 1878. Patrick's birth registration is the first recorded documentation I have, have found after their arrival. And that was when they were in Milton, even they had come all the way down here to Milton. And certainly by um, 1880, they are living in Belclutha, just a little further south. And Belclutha was a small rural town, um, and it was about 80 kilometres from, from Dunedin. Michael had by now joined the government's railway department. My grandfather James was born in Belclutha on the 24th of January 1880, followed by a brother and two sisters. With a growing family, the railway would provide a steady and assured income. Michael was is first listed as a labourer, uh, then a serviceman. The term serviceman means uh, a man who worked on the bed of the railway track and laid the track. The family had moved to Waitahuna by February 1894, and Michael had been promoted to ganger, and that means he was now a foreman in charge of a gang. And this is Waitahuna up here. Now, also in 1894, um, uh, Michael had been employed by the railway department for almost 14 years, and his salary was seven and sixpence per day. And I thought it would be interesting to go and see what seven and sixpence a day in 1894 would buy. So I went to our um, papers past, 
and looked up the old newspaper at Lewisless for 1894 to get an idea on what the basic um, commodities would cost then. So it was quite interesting to see that tea rated fairly expensively at one and seven pence per pound and a loaf of bread, um, seven pence. I imagine a four pound loaf of bread is quite a, a large loaf of bread. Now, um, I found this photo of Wadahuna taken around 1900, the time in which Michael and his family would have been there. This little town was once a flourishing gold miners' town when uh, gold was discovered in the Waitahuna Gully in 1861. It was also briefly a railway terminus as the railway lines expanded um, into Otago, particularly Lawrence and Roxburgh. In the middle foreground of the photo is the railway's goods shed and station. And I've just circled those there because uh, it's quite pertinent to what was to where Michael was working. And just beyond that is the town, little town itself. Now I wanted to. This is the same photograph with a, um, a wider angled view. But I, I wanted to draw your attention to what we call railway houses. Um, the railway department had purchased or built houses for station masters and other staff since at least the 1870s. A ganger may have been entitled to a house, and, and certainly this would be expected in later years. And if Michael did live in a railway house, it would be likely to be one of these. That, and they were nearly always situated close to the railway. So there's two here, and they're always very distinctive. We, we New Zealanders know them well in our, um, in our towns where, where they're beside the railway line. They're all of the same design. There may be two, two designs so that they look different, but basically they're all the same design. Now, today, um, Waitahuna is a farming community. It's in a very beautiful part of Otago. And the railway station could shed buildings still stand on the site. Now, a recent Google image that I found taken in 2020 shows that the railway station is being restored. The plan is for the station building uh, to open as a museum with artifacts and stories from Waitahuna's Maori and European history, and for the goods shed to be redeveloped to provide a shelter and light refreshments for cyclists on the rail trail and, and for general public use. Uh, I, I don't know if you uh, know uh, the rail trails are uh, cyclist tracks that um, that uh, run along the old existing railway beds and throughout Otago there is, is quite a lot of them and they are slowly linking up and you can cycle from place to place via the old railway beds and this will just be another stop along along the way. So a lot of interest in the old station and the, and the good shed. Now um, Michael and Sophia appear on the 1905 electoral roll living in Lovell's flat, which is just north of Belcluther. Their stay there wasn't very long, as by 1907 they had moved to Christchurch. Michael is still working for the railways, so there are two possibilities for the move. He was either transferred by the department or he had requested a transfer. Christchurch was now um, to become their permanent home. First, they were living in uh, Fitzgerald Avenue and then at 96 Stanmore. Uh, that's now a shopping centre. And then moving on to 507 Hereford Street. Now, Hereford, the house of Hereford Street was um, a solid structure, plain and simple in design 
but it was to stay in the family for just on 100 years and became known to us all as simply 507. So just to give some idea of, of those three locations in relationship to the centre of Christchurch, the big purple dot here is Cathedral Square. And then just a couple of blocks up here, we have Fitzgerald Avenue. I, I don't know exactly where they lived then. Um, at the time, there was no street numbering. Then Stanmore Road is here. That's now the shopping centre. And then the final house here at 507 Hereford Street on the corner of England and Hereford. The photograph I've put in here is um, it's not dated. Um, it came from the Hocken Snapshot Library. It is of the Cathedral Square, probably I think by the ladies' dresses around the 1900 mark. So this would have been sort of the city that Michael and Sophia had moved to. Uh, just in the dark patch here um, behind trees is the Anglican Cathedral which was badly damaged in the um, 2011 earthquakes. Uh, Michael continued to work on the railway and live at 507 until his retirement in 1914. He and Sophia then lived in Wellington for a short time with their daughter, Margaret. But by 1922, they were back in Christchurch. In my journey to trace Michael and Sophia, I discovered they had raised a large family and that Sophia may have been part of New Zealand's history. 1893, um, the, in New Zealand um, legislation was passed to allow women to vote in parliamentary elections. The suffrage movement had presented to Parliament a petition in support of women's suffrage. Some of that petition has survived, but unfortunately not the section that would have covered the Belcluther area. So we will never know if Sophia signed the petition, but she is on the 1893 Clutha electoral roll as Sophia Grady, and based on such an early registration on the electoral roll, I believe Sophia probably signed the petition. A lot of women weren't, uh, didn't sign, in, uh, or sorry, weren't on the roll in 1893. Uh, they still had to overcome some um, resentment from families and that sort of kind of thing. Uh, but that's why I suspect that because uh, Sophia is on the early roll, uh, she had the support of her family, obviously. Now, the um, granny girls, there were five of their daughters here, um, Margaret, Honora, Adelia, Mary and Sophia. They all married and had families of their own. Only Catherine, the eldest daughter, didn't marry and became her mother's greatest help with the growing family. Now she died in 1918, um, aged just 42 and probably I think it was from TB. The Grainy boys, um, Andrew, Patrick, James, Thomas and William, all took different paths, but John um, was to die tragically in 1907. I could only find the one photo um, of my grandfather James is on the left and his younger brother William on, on the right. And the shy ones, of course, are Andrew, Patrick, Thomas, and John. Now, most families have a black sheep, and in the Granny family, it was Andrew. The family folklore has it that he was run out of Waiatahuna by the local priest, and one of them was on horseback. We uh, assume because he got away that it was Andrew. Uh, he never had any contact with the family again. And just um, keeping ahead of the law for minor offences, um, I know I, I traced him to Auckland in, and he was in the Auckland area around uh, 1912. And then he disappears again. 
maybe this time next time to pop up in Australia. It took me a few years to find him, only to discover that he had uh, died in Melbourne in 1942. He had never married and is buried in a friend's family plot. Patrick, on the other hand, lived his entire life in Belclutha. He trained as a linear typist for the press newspaper. And he later purchased a billiard saloon that he operated with some success until his death. But he was recognized most of all for being a bit of authority on horse racing and especially the trotters. And he had married and had two children. Thomas uh, followed his father and joined the railway as a guard. And after several moves around the North Island, retired in Auckland. He had four children and his eldest son, Robert, uh, died in 1942 while serving with um, the New Zealand military forces. He was just 19 at, at the time. Now, William became a marine engineer and worked on ships traveling between New Zealand and Australia before going uh, to America in 1918. He married an English girl in Detroit, Michigan, and then settled into California. He has two sons, um, both married and had large families of their own. And that's my very own American, Irish American connection. Now, this is the saddest of stories. Um, John was aged uh, just 18 and he died suddenly from diphtheria in 1907. And it was just shortly after he arrived in Christchurch. He was the unfortunate victim of a quack doctor um, who treated the diphtheria with icing sugar dissolved in warm water. There was an inquest and the so-called doctor was charged with manslaughter, receiving a sentence of a mere four months imprisonment. Now the incident was widely reported in newspapers at the time. Um, as the doctor had been under some suspicion and investigation by one of um, our more colourful newspapers of the time, and that was called the New Zealand Truth. And I've included this colourful piece of prose for you to have a look at. Um, and this was quite typical of their reporting. I'll just give you a couple of minutes to have a look at that. A nice character, no doubt about it. It was very unfortunate at, at the time. Um, obviously, uh, Michael and his family uh, were quite unaware, not having been in Christchurch for very long, and the very fact that doctor was in front of this man's name, uh, they assumed that he was a medical doctor and uh, had sought his help when John first fell ill. Really, really quite a sad story. Now, um, James is my grandfather, and he married Cecilia Nelson in 1918. They had 11 children, two of which died in infancy. My father, Brendan, now only his mother called him Brendan, he was Ben to everyone else, was uh, the second born and the first son. He too um, joined the railway department in 1939, first as a cleaner before uh, he passed examinations to become a fireman, then again as an engine driver, um, all on steam locomotives. And in 1954, he gained his driver's uh, certificate for the new diesel electric uh, locomotives. 
the newspaper cutting shows um, my grandfather when he retired after he uh, had been working for 70 years. He was 78 when he retired. Um, he started work as a paper boy at the age of eight. And the little photo is three generations. That's uh, Michael and um, Jane standing at the back and my father Ben on, on the up the chair. Now, uh, Michael died on uh, the 28th of November, 1924, and Sophia on the 9th of November, 1938. And in spite of a lot of damage in the um, cemetery due to the 2011 earthquakes, Michael and Sophia's headstone remained standing. Now, Michael and Sophia certainly did their best to contribute to New Zealand's population boom. Sophia gave birth to 14 children, of which 12 reached adulthood, all of whom had an education. Uh, their descendants number about 160 to the fifth generation, and that's the generation of my son. After that, I've lost count. It's pretty hard to keep up with them all at that point. And that's just what the family looks like. Now, you may recall we know Michael had a brother, Patrick, as he also immigrated to um, New Zealand. Patrick was born uh, circa 1851 and went with Michael to England to work. He then met and married Mary Conway on the 21st of April 1872. Patrick was 21 and Mary just 15. Now, uh, they left... Um, Vasco, just over a year after Michael, uh, Patrick and Mary and their two children, Francis and Catherine, had then arrived in Port Chalmers aboard the Wild Deer on uh, the 3rd of April, 1878. Now, unfortunately, there's no um, passenger list for this voyage. Uh, Cargills and Gibbs and company were the agents. And it's likely that they sponsored and paid for um, all the passengers on this voyage. Patrick um, and Mary stayed with Michael and Sophia when they first arrived, and two more children were born in Belclutha, that were Bridget and Michael. Patrick appears to have joined the New Zealand Railways, and they are living in Dunedin uh, by 1882. Now, I became aware of that um, because in January 1882, tragedy struck the family when it is thought that Patrick had been celebrating at the Southern Hotel the arrival of his fifth child on the 13th of January. He had probably had one too many and on the way home fell into the Dunedin Harbour and drowned. Mary was left a widow um, at 25 with five children under eight. Some 40 pounds was raised by the railway men for, Pat, for uh, the railway men that Patrick worked with um, to help support Mary and her children. And another tragedy followed the family just a few months later when on the first of April, Catherine, um, aged six died at Belclutha with scarlet fever. Although life would have been difficult during this time, Mary made friends with another Irish um, immigrant, Rose, and was introduced to Rose's cousin, John, who had recently arrived in New Zealand. A courtship began and they married in Dunedin in 1860, uh, 1886. They were to have five children together, and the family moved from Dunedin to Napier in the North Island by 1896. Patrick and Mary's son, Patrick, went on to marry the daughter of Rose, and that linked the two families of Mary Graney and her good friend Rose forever. So, Thank you, everyone, for um, allowing me to tell my story. I hope 
hope you've all enjoyed it. And I shall stop sharing now and join you. Okay.